Alright guys, I've been meaning to get to this for some time now and uh, really this bolt has taken a whole lot longer than I thought it was going to because of the different characteristics of threads versus the, um, the diameter of the bolt, um, the basic major diameter. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, the common name obviously would be a bolt. McMaster car and, and a lot of the engineers have been around calling cap screws. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do with this video is I wanted to do, I've seen a lot of guys do threads and I wanted to do a video that showed a bolt that looks similar to what they actually manufacture. So I went and grabbed a number of different bolts out of my, you know, miscellaneous bolts drawer. And um, so real quick, we'll go over what the bolt looks like. You've got most bolts have a chamfer up here on top. And when they do these bolts, they cold form them or hot form them. And then they either roll the threads. I didn't have any bolts that they actually cut the threads. They're all roll formed. And so the good quality bolts have this little um, uh, shoulder here on the bottom. And then most of the bolts also, when they come out of the machine, I would imagine when they're first formed, this edge here is really sharp. And so they go through some sort of process where they crush the corner over. They, I'm guessing that maybe in its raw form, it wouldn't fit an open end wrench. So they push these corners in, in some sort of um, finishing process that uh, makes it so that they don't stick out and cut you and all that good stuff. <clears throat> and then the threads are roll formed. They're not exactly what a lot of the threads had flat bottoms. I chose to radius mine. And uh, there's a number of things wrong with this with this model as far as there's sizes that don't exist. So I did um, get the sizes that don't exist are, ele I believe, 11 sixteenths, 16 13 sixteenths, and 15 sixteenths are all sizes that do not exist. Uh, I don't know about the 11, but I know 13 and 15 don't exist. And then down at the small end, um, triple lot, double lot, and single lot don't exist. And I'm not even sure one and two. Uh, these are number one and number two. That's why they've got an N in front of them. I can't remember what size they actually get ahead on them for you know through McMaster Car, but um, the thing that I also wanted to show in this bolt is that. Um, the last thread has both run out and stops its feed. It has its pitch goes to zero. If you look at any any um, bolt, actually, I want to be on quarter twenty, so we'll rebuild real quick. Um, but yeah, if you look at the last thread, it's the machine's pulling out, and it's also the last thread. The pitch goes from whatever the normal pitch is, which quarter twenty is point zero five to zero basically it wrap, that last thread wraps on itself and that's so that the thread never interferes with this fillet that's um, usually on all bolts this fillet here is a little large I think but all bolts have a tiny tiny fillet in the corner there you know, all good bolts do and then the other thing I noticed is a lot of people chamfer the bottom here at 45 and I checked a number of bolts and the chamfer is not 45. Every bolt I checked it was between 30 and 35 degrees. So I chamfered this bolt off at 30 degrees. And so we'll go ahead and step through this. You can see that, oh, and um, this is actually supposed to be hooked up to a um, um, design table. I had already made that up. The last video it has a custom design table. This originally was hooked up, but it was giving me fits. And so, um, we'll blank out this part. Uh, shared folders. E. So this is what it's supposed to be linked to, and we want to link it to the file. And we want to block changes from the model. We don't want the model to be able to change the file. Uh, you're going to find out that there's some formulas in here that control the bolt inside SolidWorks. And there's the external file that controls a lot of it too. So we'll go ahead and link that up. It's not going to do a whole lot because I already have all the configurations in here. Um, it's going to open it up and check it. And 
I'm going to close it. And I don't know how long this process is going to take because I'm inside of a uh, virtual machine here, so I may edit this part. All right, um, oh, not this again. So yeah, I had problems with um, Solid, SolidWorks having to go through every configuration. It says it excels waiting for another OLE action some sort of Excel problem. So I'm going to pause you guys because this takes a long ass time. So we'll uh, pause the. All right, guys. Uh, so I'm back. Um, there's a, there's a problem in my SolidWorks. It's uh, probably 2014 uh, service pack zero or something like that with um, linking an Excel file to SolidWorks, hopefully they fixed it in future versions where it, it's basically waiting for Excel to, if I had to guess in my mind, Excel goes through every single configuration and checks it. And Excel says that it's waiting for an OLE application to finish or something like that. It takes forever, so I paused it while it did that. Hopefully for you guys it doesn't do that. So we'll go ahead and go through the part. Um, on cylindrical parts, I think best practice is to always start out with an axis. Um, so I put an axis um, between the right and the front plane. And that just gives me, it's good for a lot of things. Um, you're not depending on faces. And when you go to mate the parts, the mate's always in the same spot. So for me, that's best practice. And then I started the cylinder top planes up here so my bolt goes down um, and I did that on purpose because I want the mating surface to be the top plane one of the mating surfaces and so that's always the start of the head um, I don't know what other users do but for me that's going to be a, a consistent mating surface I can mate to the top plane again I don't have to worry about a face moving around or disappearing or changing ID numbers or whatever so in this case, I made this one inch, and um, on this particular bolt, if you shorten the um, shaft, um, you're prob you're going to have to adjust the height of the helix on the cut on the swept cut. I was going to automate it and make it look at the height of the bolt, but I just don't give a crap. If I use this a lot, I'll pull out some of the configurations I don't use anyways, and then I'll, I'll clean it up and do what I need to do. So in this case, it's one uh, quarter. This is going to be a quarter 20 bolt. Um, this thing's quarter by one. And then um, I went ahead and added the chamfer straight away so that it's not trying to chamfer through the um, threads and whatnot and then um, cut sweep six I'm actually gonna roll back um, I want to show you the the components um, but this is the actual threads it threads the shaft before the head goes on and because I'm running a virtual machine this takes a little bit in my system um, so I'm going to roll this back real quick and get these uh, sketches on the other side. So the helix, if you've ever done a helix, is derived from, I just took the 
um, sketch at boss extrude one and I projected it down onto this bottom onto this face here so if we look at the um, sketch plane it's this face right here and then I just um, I just took boss extrude one and I took this sketch which is up top here and I can do the convert entities on the sketch plane right here convert entities and then under the helix spiral command, what I have, and you can link all this stuff, I've got a variable pitch. So from 0 to 18 revolutions, it's constant at 0 0.05, which is uh, um, 20 threads per inch. And then the last one from 18 and a half to 21, it uh, spirals outward, or the revolutions the pitch becomes much smaller at 0 0.01 and the diameter also pulls out at 0.3 so there's like a lead out and when you do these you can link these so if we actually go and look at um, this diameter here is linked to this diameter the quarter and then if we go down to the end it's um, times uh, 1.2 so it's 120 percent of quarter and then if you look at the revolutions this one here is threads per inch plus one and this one is threads per inch minus 1.5 and so you can kind of fool around with those the tighter the pitch gets the you'll have to pull those numbers down a little bit they'll change and so you'll notice on some of the finer threads I've adjusted them out and you can obviously do that over here you can pick this configuration all configurations or you can specify and so in this case I've got this set for this configuration and then the tooth form is we'll go down here and take a look at that Now I could have went off of um, uh, my machine tool handbook in front of me. The root diameter, the nominal root diameter, and I could have went with max or min and fucked around with that, or excuse me, fooled around with that for um, for a while. But I just went off of basic major diameter. That way, if I take a measurement outside for whatever reason, I still I I can get what size it was intended to be. Um, and I can, uh, your machinist or whoever is cutting the threads is going to look at what you spec for your, for your holes. So he's, he's not going to go off of your part unless you tell him to specifically. Uh, so in this case, the, um, the root radius, the, um, radius at the root is, um, pitch times 0.25 and that's in the machine tool handbook um, uh, with the finer threads I went pitch times 0.125 just because this was so big on really small threads um, and then w this is confusing but I'll explain this so what this is this number here is from center line of thread to the point where the relief um, fill it right here ends that can be no more it shouldn't it cannot be equal it has to be less than um, pitch and so then this right here is distance between sharps so if this fillet wasn't here and there was a sharp here it just went from this line to this line and I trimmed them out with this without this radius relief this is this number here what you'll find is this number here I gotta look real quick and make sure okay I'm right the number from the center line to the very tip of the radius relief has to be bigger one bigger times two than this number and let me explain that basically I took this number and I've got percentages here. So this is pitch divided by 2 times 80%. That 80% has to be bigger than this number's percentage, which is um, pitch, or um, yeah, pitch times 70%.
and if you get these numbers inverted, if this is 80% and this is 70%, the, the um, sketch will error out. So um, that's the, the whole deal on these two. This has to have a higher percentage on it than this does. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and pull past the sweep and OK that. And we'll go down to boss extrude 2. Now there may be variations on head heights um, with different materials. I didn't check stainless bolts. They may have a taller head or, and of course there's different heads you can order through McMaster car. This was just the basic cap size. I pulled all my numbers off McMaster. So if you're fasten all numbers different, um, adjust accordingly. So the first one here is just the size of the flats and then the overall height. Those are pulled from the um, uh, my brain's gone blank this morning. From your configuration table, from your design table, excuse me. Those two numbers are pulled from that. Um, and then you've got um, what's next? I think it's the relief on the top flats, but I won't know for sure till it, till it runs. Yeah. So this right here, what I drew is I drew a circle that touches all the flats. It's just tangent. And then the cut extrude, I flipped side to cut. And again, this is being slow because it's in a um, virtual machine. And once I get past that sweep, everything grinds. If I could figure out how to make the sweep quicker, I would. So it says flip side to cut. You know, I've flipped the side that's cutting. It's on the outside of the, of the uh, circle instead of the inside. And then I've got it drafting outwards at 45 degrees. Uh, in this case, draft outwards would actually be draft inwards because it's the opposite, because it's the outside. I, I sort of think that's stupid, but I get it. So in this case, it's drafting what it would call inwards, but it's outwards because it's reversed around the sketch. So 45 degrees, and that's pretty straightforward. And then, like I said before, most good bolt manufacturers are going to have this shoulder, which is right here. And I actually pulled this in with an offset. I found that the shoulder is actually in off of the flats a tiny bit. And let's see how much did I pull that in. That is... Uh, five thousandths in off the edge of the flats. On the larger bolts, it's um, 0.1 tall, 0 0.01, so ten thousandths. On the really small bolts, it changes it to 0 0.05, five thousandths tall. I'm not sure what it actually is on some really large bolts, but it's pretty small. It's just enough for it to land against. Um, and then, let's see, we got our fillet, which is there at the head. So this little fillet here, and I have that at what, 15 thousandths on this particular one. That's controlled by the design table, so you guys can control that through the design table and put the numbers you want. And then the chamfer that's added at the last is just a chamfer on the flats that the manufacturers put on there so that, um, that the bolt doesn't catch on on wrenches so it's just the corners being dubbed off and I, I don't know how they do it they smash it or they they do something in a machine that pushes the edge over so that's the deal on the universal cap screw I'm gonna also do an allen head here next and there's some other ones I may do flanged head possibly and uh, maybe a button head or something so we'll see about that but um, I hope this helps someone. Hope you guys liked the video and talk to you later. Bye.